All right, supervisors, I think we'll go ahead and begin. Welcome to the Fire Recovery Town Hall with County Supervisors Bruce McPherson and Ryan Coonerty. A few housekeeping items before we get started tonight. Upon joining the call, all participants are muted and their cameras are deactivated. We will only see and hear tonight's speakers. There are two reasons for this. One, we want to minimize any disruptions in the background to ensure everyone can be heard clearly. And two, we want to make sure we get to the Q&A portion in a way that gives the maximum number of people the opportunity to ask questions. After our speakers make their presentations, those of you joining us on the Zoom application on your computers or your mobile device should type your questions using the Q&A function in the webinar rather than the chat function or virtually raising your hand. Those functions are too difficult to manage on a call with a large number of participants and we don't wanna miss any questions. When we see your questions pop up in the Q&A, the supervisors will read them aloud and ensure they get answered by the right person on the webinar. If you're joining by phone, you can submit questions during the webinar to jm.brown at santacruzcounty.us and we'll read them on your behalf. Lastly, we are recording the webinar tonight and we'll share it on social media and elsewhere for those who were not able to join us or want to refer back to information learned tonight. With that, I'll turn it over to Supervisor Bruce McPherson. Thank you, Jam, and good evening and welcome. And thank you for joining us and thank you to Supervisor Ryan Coonerty for co-hosting this webinar and our ongoing recovery from the CZ as you lightning fire uh, complex fire. Uh, things are moving quickly and there's a lot of ground to cover tonight. We have leaders from the state and federal agencies who are critical to managing these early phases of our recovery process. And we also have county staff who are working to prepare for us, uh, prepare us for the dangerous uh, debris flow, flows who are, which are likely to come uh, when we have intense rain this fall or winter. As many of you know, uh, phase one removal uh, of the hazardous material is underway now by the Environmental Protection Agency. We will hear an update about this, uh, about their efforts this evening, as well as how to prepare for phase two removal of other debris. Uh, both of these steps are critical to the rebuilding process that is being worked on uh, without, within our county. On Tuesday, this last Tuesday, uh, Supervisor Coonerty and I received unanimous approval for our proposal to create the Office of Recovery and Resilience, which will include a dedicated manager and full-time staff to help our residents navigate the process. We will be staffing this team with existing county employees to reduce cost, given our budget situation driven by the COVID-19 revenue losses. But we know we need uh, to dedicate these resources in order to get it right. And Supervisor Coonerty and I will be overseeing this process on the board level. Now I will turn it over to Supervisor Coonerty now for, to further welcome you and introduce our speakers and other guests for this evening. And thank you again for joining us. Thank you. Thank you, Supervisor McPherson. Uh, it's been great to partner with you and your office as we respond to uh, what is the biggest disaster in Santa Cruz history. First, to everyone who uh, is uh, listening tonight, who has lost a home um, or their business or parts of their property, we wanna express our sincerest condolences. We know that people are experiencing trauma and we're doing our best to respond in every way we can. Tonight is an effort to, to bring together the many different agencies uh, at different levels of government that are working collaboratively to try to address uh, this complex issue. Um, tonight we will have as primary presenters Ryan Burris. He's the Deputy Director of the Cal Office of Emergency Services. We have Willie Nunn, who's the Federal Coordinating Officer from FEMA, uh, which is at the federal level of government. And we have Kent Edler, who's from the County Public Works Department. He's going to talk about debris flows. Also on this call, we have Nicole Coburn from the County Administrative Office, and Elisa Benson and Matt Machado, also from the County Administrative Office and Department of Public Works. We have Marilyn Underwood from the County Environmental Health, Carolyn Burke from County Planning, uh, J.M. Brown, who you heard from, from Supervisor McPherson's office, as well as Jenny Johnson, uh, and then from my office, Rachel Dan. We are all here to try to answer your questions. We encourage you uh, to put your questions into the, into the Q&A uh, so that we can, ask, um, we can ask those questions and 
chances are if you have those questions, there's dozens if not hundreds of others of people who, uh, who have those questions as well. Uh, we wanna make sure we get as much information out to you as quickly as we possibly can. Uh, so for our presenter tonight, first I'm gonna ask Ryan Burris from Cal OES uh, to start with an overview of the Cal OES efforts in this uh, disaster response. Thank you, Ryan, very much. And thanks to everyone uh, that's online and thanks for all the local, state, and federal partners uh, that's presenting uh, today. First, I would like to start off by just saying I would like to thank um, all the local leaders. Uh, they've been uh, closely coordinating with uh, Cal OES since day one. Uh, we have a team dedicated uh, working with your local officials uh, and moving uh, this along. So I just want to thank all of you. Uh, disasters start and, and, and locally, and you have a wonderful team supporting you during these recovery efforts and these tough times. So uh, thank you for, for all of your support and making Cal OES's job uh, and uh, FEMA's job easy. Um, secondly, um, on debris, um, you know, phase one has begun, and there'll be some conversations just on the US EPA and how they're doing it for this particular area on phase one, which is critical for picking up those those hazardous household uh, materials, such as small propane tanks and um, uh, paint, uh, any sort of uh, cleaning supplies that's on the ground, anything that's a hazard as you walk around that. So uh, that has begun. Uh, I would like to say there's great news as of today. We, we did get phase two approved uh, by, the, by uh, uh, the federal coordinating officer. And so he's on the screen today. So I would like to really appreciate the efforts and the coordination from Mr. Willie Nunn. Uh, doing this. This is uh, a very complex uh, thing to get approved, uh, personal property debris removal. It is not something that happens on a regular basis during disasters, but since the complexity of this disaster in this particular area led to this level of effort, uh, they did approve it. So just to set some expectations on that, uh, that does not mean that we're going to start seeing trucks on the ground removing uh, debris tomorrow. Uh, what we will see over the next um, uh, coming weeks is phase one debris being removed. Uh, that's, the, that's the first step of the recovery process for debris. Um, it's going to take several weeks for us to get this contract in place and awarded, uh, but when phase one is complete, uh, we can quickly go into phase two with this approval letter, which as of uh, this morning when we woke up, we did not have this wonderful news. So uh, it was in perfect timing uh, for this. And once we get that debris removed, we can start doing that recovery efforts, working with all of you, um, working with you know, um, uh, your local leaders on any housing issues that you have, any gaps, supporting you uh, and continuous supporting you at you know, local assistance centers or, or uh, whatever is open and uh, you know, along the way. But I just want to let you know, um, um, like Nicole just got a hug, I would like to know that we're here hugging all of you. We'll be here throughout this uh, recovery effort. Uh, this is something that we stay, we, we will be there through the end supporting you. So I just want you to know, it doesn't start and end with phase one and phase two. Recovery is a very long process. Uh, there was a lot of destruction in this area. Uh, it's a tough year for all of you and we're here for you throughout. So I look forward, Ryan, to answering questions uh, that any of the viewers have, but I'll turn it back to you. Thank you, uh, and uh, I think we already have some questions coming in. That's great news about phase two. We've been on uh, pins and needles uh, to get that approved, and we're grateful that it has been approved. Uh, Willie Nunn from uh, FEMA, would you like to uh, share some remarks? Uh, thank you, Supervisor. Uh, good evening, everybody, everyone. Um, uh, I'd like to start out by saying also, also to uh, my, my definitely concern about all those impacted by uh, the fires, the August fires, and, and continuing being impacted. Um, on the, there are 13 counties in this decoration for the August fires and Santa Cruz, I would say, is one of the most impacted, especially for individuals. Uh, we have over 13,000 uh, uh, registrants at this time and about almost 5,000 of them are from Santa Cruz. And with that, with that number, we have approved individual household program of about $4.3 million for, for uh, approval as folks register. The max award as a, as for, for this is a grant uh, for a household is $35,500. Uh, we also have rental assistance, which is not a part of that max grant that we have, that, the, that folks, if you qualify for the rental assistance, 
uh, and continue to qualify, that could be good up until 18 months, but that's a qualification factor behind that. Um, as uh, it was great to speak to the Board of Supervisors on, on yesterday, uh, as I told, told them then, is uh, right now we're looking at about uh, 20 folks who have received that max award in, in Santa Cruz County and that in Santa Cruz County, uh, it was reported in the beginning that we had about uh, 940 plus uh, residences uh, destroyed. Um, uh, right now, uh, um, um, maybe destroyed and may major damage, but right now we have verified only about uh, 43 of those being homeowners and 37 being renters, so about 80, about a tenth of that. But that's not the end. Uh, the registrants who have registered uh, almost those 5,000, we get that data from you. So uh, we continue, we continue the registration period is open, but it's also open for the survivors to call back with questions. Um, to call back if you get a determination letter that says uh, you, you may not be eligible for this because, and we would like for you to continue to read that letter thoroughly because you may answer one question that puts you into another bucket of qualification. So it's important that you read those letters. It's important that you call back. And as I, as I get on that, the, the, the registration, if you haven't by now, you can do it three ways, the disasterassistance.gov, or you can download the FEMA on a mobile, on a, on a mobile app on your, on your iPhone or tablet, or you call the 1-800-621-3362 uh, phone, li phone line, and that phone line is open from 7 to uh, 1030 at 7 a.m. to 1030 at night, Pacific Daylight Time. And also we have multilingual operators on that line. It's important not only to register on that line, but to call back, as I said before, because this is important. This is the data that we look to support the citizens and support the county. Um, and, as we, and as we look through this, uh, I'll be looking forward to the questions that you may have about, the, about any of the assistance that we may have. Um, and I also, I think I have a, um, um, a subject matter expert online as well, but if not, I think I can, I can hold my own and answer most of those questions. Uh, but uh, looking forward to those questions tonight, sir. Great, thank you very much. Um, and sadly, while we're responding to one disaster, we're preparing for another. Uh, we have Kent Edler from the Department of Public Works here to talk about the threat of uh, debris flow that uh, is likely to happen uh, as, as winter rains begin. Good evening, everyone. Uh, JM, if you can throw up the, the PowerPoint, that would be awesome. Uh, Ken, you might want to just give a brief introduction while I get that loaded, if you would, please. Okay. Um, so I'm uh, Kent Edler. I'm one of the assistant directors of public works for the County of Santa Cruz. Um, and I'm going to give a, an abbreviated uh, presentation. This is a presentation that Carolyn Burke and I gave to the board uh, a little bit over a week ago to kind of talk about the debris flow hazards um, that, that are in the in the burn area and down slope of the of the burn area, and Carolyn's on the on the call as well today, and hopefully we'll get this going soon. Yeah, it's uh, giving me problems. Sorry, um, you might just want to start, Kent, um, reading, and I'll um, I'll try to get it. Um, I'll try to get it up for you. Okay. Sorry. So. Basically, um, the debris flows are, are a major issue. And so debris flows are essentially they're fast moving masses of mud, rock, boulders, and trees um, that sometimes can include homes and, and vehicles. Um, they're similar to landslides, but they actually they flow over large areas. Um, and they and debris flows are, are normally um, we see those even without fires. So those are those are kind of common occurrences in the Santa Cruz Mountains, but they're really intensified after a storm uh, or after a fire. Um, and part of that reason is because what happens is the when the fire goes over a, a, over an area, it it actually scorches the earth and it creates a an area that's that's impermeable to 
to rainfall. So the water doesn't soak into the ground. And what that means is that you're gonna have more volume of water that's coming down, down the hillsides and then out these, out the, the chutes of these, these drainage areas. And these are typically started by intense rainfall. It's not the long prolonged rainfall over 24 hours. It's really short periods, short bursts of rainfall. We're talking on the order of a quarter of an inch over 15 minutes is the type of um, rainfall that, that can come down and really start these, these debris flows. Um, we had some pictures up, that would be great, but um, hopefully we'll get that, those going. I have the slides up here on my end, so I'll kind of follow along. Um, so what happens after the, um, after the fire is that the, the state has a, what they call the Watershed Emergency Response Team, or the WERT, so they come out and they do a preliminary report and they identify areas of the probabilities of debris flow and they identify areas that they think were, were that are at high risk. So there's a lot of areas that are, that are out there that we're concerned about um, throughout the burn area and actually areas outside of the burn area in like the Boulder Creek area um, along Highway 9 corridor. Those are, there's a lot of, um, of structures down there, a lot of homes that are, that are at risk because they're below drainage, drainage areas that are downslope of the, of the burn area. So um, there's some, uh, some facts that we want to get out about debris flows is that um, residents and, and the county really, we can't really anticipate exactly where or when these debris flows will happen. Um, it's more than that they're just, it's possible that they're gonna happen. It's, we feel that it's really probable that, that it's going to happen. Um, and you can't, it, it's a little bit different than a fire. I know a lot of people stayed behind and fight the fire, but with debris flows, it's a different beast altogether. You really can't stay behind and protect your home from, from a debris flow. They, they happen instantaneously. Almost as soon as the, as the radars pick up the intense rainfall is when those debris flows happen. And they, once you hear a debris flow, it's really, it's too late to get out of the way. I mean, some of these move at, um, at avalanche speed up to 30 miles an hour, so you can't really outrun them. So the only really effective, effective thing that you can do at this point is to evacuate. And so um, it's important to know that they, they're really, they're triggered by rainfall in the upper burn area. So if you're down below um, at a lower, at a lower elevation, you might have you know, lighter rain coming on and, and you might not think that, it's, um, that it, the rain's really that bad, but um, it's really the upper burn area and the, the areas up at the top where these are, are triggered. So you could have high intensity rainfall up there and you don't even know that it's going on up there. Um, and we also wanna point out that we haven't seen a fire, probably really any of us who are, who are on the call, seen a, a fire of this magnitude in this area for, you know, it's, it's probably as long as that we've been alive. So the, the Santa Cruz mountains and the, the debris flow hazards are gonna be, we're gonna be experiencing runoff like we haven't before in many, many years. So we don't want people to think that, hey, my, I haven't seen a debris flow on my property in 30 years, so it's not gonna happen. So we just really want people to realize that it's gonna be a different winter this year and the rainfall is gonna be different. So just because you haven't seen something in the past doesn't mean it's not gonna happen this year. And so we look to um, kind of recent history um, and there was a 2017, 2018 fire in, in Santa Barbara County in Montecito. Um, that was the Thomas fire. And that burned about 280,000 acres. Um, and during that fire, there was, um, unfortunately, there was one civilian casualty and one casualty from a firefighter in that, in that fire. But after the fire on January 9th, there was a large debris flow that, that came down and actually killed 23 people. Um, and so, with that, there were 24, about 36 hours in advance warning that debris flows were coming. They it just, you know, very similar to Santa Cruz County, they, they had identified that there's a high potential for debris flows to come out. But um, so they gave warnings 
you know, 36 hours in advance, but still there were a lot of people that um, unfortunately lost their homes and, and, and here we go, the slide is up. If you can, Jam, if you can move down to slide six, that would, six or seven actually, that would be great. Let's go to the, the next one. Okay, so that map on the, on the right, um, so that shows the, the red line is the, everything above the red line is the burn area, and then down below is the area of Montecito where the homes were, were, were damaged. So the, the homes in red, those are the homes that were damaged or destroyed, um, and then you know, the varying yellows and blues and, and oranges were the ones that were, were affected. And you can see that kind of the, the pink hatched areas over the blue areas, those blue areas, um, they run all the way down to the ocean. That's about two and a half miles, some of those, where the debris flows actually ran out from the, from the, the burn area all the way out to the Pacific Ocean. Uh, so the picture on the bottom left is actually Highway 101, if anybody is familiar with the Santa Barbara area. So Highway 101 was actually closed, closed for 12 days after the Montecito fire. And that picture on the bottom right shows the type of debris that that comes down from these and, and really tells you what that water does and what it can move when it starts um, when it starts flowing. So we have been in contact with the Santa Barbara officials to to see and get some ideas on, on what they learned from that. Um, and so can we uh, can we move on down jam to that? Yep. I'm up, actually. It's, we're having some connectivity issues, so it's moving rather slowly. Sorry about that. So if we can, yeah, there we go, that one. So the debris flows can extend out many, many miles, um, and they really want us to impress upon us that we need to get early, consistent public messaging out. You can, you can go ahead, too, on that jam. Um, one more. So, and we're so we are. This is this is part of that that early public messaging that we were doing. We went out to the the board about a week ago to kind of let let folks know, and we're going to continue to try to get the message out that this is a this is a real concern for us. Um, and there's not a whole lot that that we can do at this point. I mean, if there was, and I know it's hard for people to hear that they're going to have to evacuate again, um, but it's if there was something else that we could do, we. Believe me, we would be we would be recommending that to the public right now. But there there isn't a whole lot of time. You can't put out sandbags and K rail. They're just going to become part of the part of the debris. Um, you can move on to the the next one. And so what what Santa Barbara learned is that about seventy five percent of the people evacuated in the Montecito area to the fire, but only about twenty eight percent actually were willing to evacuate from uh, the debris flow for the debris, debris flow hazard warning that went out. Um, part of that was the, um, I think people, they get evacuation fatigue and they just, they don't want to evacuate again. They just got done evacuating. The one in Santa Barbara, unfortunately, a lot of people were um, evacuated over the holidays and they didn't want to evacuate again. Um, but it's the, the, the debris flow was, they happen all of a sudden. I think the, the one in Santa Barbara that happened, it happened about 3.45 in the morning and they had in five minutes, they got about a half an inch of rain in five minutes. And that just, and it was after a really dry season as well. So it, it wasn't, there wasn't a lot of built up moisture in the ground and so forth. It was just that quick burst that, that came down. But um, the, the officials saw that storm coming um, a few days ahead of time and tried to get out as much notice as they could. Let's move down to the next one. Oh, so, yeah, so the last one is um, we want to just make sure that um, people realize that debris flows really need to be taken as seriously as a wildfire, if not more seriously. Next slide. So right now what the county's doing is that we have geologic teams that are out in the areas mapping, um, mapping the areas that are at risk, the homes and so forth. Um, there's, that includes our county geologists, um, other geologic staff at the county. We also have consulting geologists. And just to kind of let folks know about how serious this is, the, the state, so the California Geologic Survey, Cal Fire geologists, and also um, USGS are out there right now. Um, and they have been out for the last couple of weeks really concentrating on Santa Cruz County. 
And if you think about all the fires that are going on in the county, in, in the statewide right now, and they're really focusing in on Santa Cruz County. So that should give you a sense of the concern when you have um, the state folks really sending some of their best geologists out to Santa Cruz County. Uh, next, Jim. So we are, so kind of following up on the geologic mapping, we're hope that mapping will be done on Friday. Is, and so we're gonna be handing that over on Friday to the, um, the first responders. So Cal Fire, um, the local fire protection districts, and they're gonna start using the, the areas that are at risk to really develop the evacuation plans and so forth. So that should be coming out um, probably in the next week or so will the, the evacuation zones will be coming out. So we've been doing a lot of um, multi-agency coordination behind the scenes, including conversations with the National Weather Service so we can get those trigger points ready. So when storms come in, so we know exactly when to say it's time for people to, to start moving and evacuate next. So um, even today, we had about a two hour meeting with our geologic staff, emergency services, sheriff's office, Cal Fire, local fire protection districts, public works staff, um, and, and some other agencies to really get that evacuation planning going. So we're definitely working on it behind, behind the scenes. Um, just want everybody to know that, um, that we're working hard on, on that. And so, and some of that discussion is around um, it's not just evacuation planning, but part of that evacuation planning is about messaging and how we're gonna message that out. And, and there's gonna be cases where we're gonna to have to go door to door. We're gonna to have to use um, the Zone Haven app. Um, we want people to sign up for Code Red, Reverse 911, um, use social media. We're gonna be using the, the news media. Um, next slide. So, um, we really want residents to start making a plan. We know the maps aren't out yet, but um, it's really when, the, especially when those maps come out, make a plan, know if you're in the evacuation area, look on the county website, we're gonna post all that stuff on there. Um, people may be evacuated multiple times, so know where you're gonna go, have your, your valuables packed up, have them ready. Next. Um, and sign up for those emergency alerts, like I mentioned on the, on the previous slide, um, like, the, um, the, the code red alert and so forth. And we want people to just evacuate. Don't stay behind. Don't think that you can fight these things. It's not, there's really not much that you can do. I don't, I shouldn't say there's not much. There's nothing that you can do when, when the debris flow comes. Um, and so stay, stay alert when, you know, if there's, if there's a storm coming, stay awake, we're not always gonna be, be there to let people know that, that there's something gonna happen. So if you feel like, you know what, it's just raining really hard and I'm just not, I just don't feel safe, get out. Don't, you don't, we want to impress upon people. We can, we can do all the messaging and everything that, that we can, but people have to take responsibility as well and, and, and just really heed those warnings and, and take some, Take some initiative and, and self-monitor. If they just just don't wait for someone to tell you to evacuate. And a uh, couple more on there, Jam. Next. So for existing homes that are out there, we want people to contact a licensed geologist if you're concerned about your your property to get an assessment of your property um, and any sort of debris flow risks that are out there. And, and you know there might be a possibility where you can install a deflection wall or berms, but um, that's going to take some time to do if a geologist recommends that. Um, and then also, um, we really don't want people to reoccupy home sites. In, in that were burned down into debris flow hazard areas without clearance from a licensed professional geologist. Um, we don't want people to rebuild in an area that's, that's just gonna get wiped out by a debris flow. Um, and especially if, you, if somebody is gonna be putting, uh, you know, like a, an RV or a trailer or something out there, we need to know about that so we can, um, so we can get those people evacuated as well. So it, it should all be done through, through the county if people are gonna be um, reoccupying on a temporary basis. And that's the end of my, my presentation. Uh, thank you, Kent. I'm gonna, we have a lot of really good questions and I'm gonna try to group some questions together uh, so that we can try to get to these questions. Uh, first is um, about debris flows uh, and someone points out in San Lorenzo Valley, also in Bonnie Dune, uh, there's often not 
cell, phone, cell coverage or landlines. Um, and other, there was challenges with the code red system uh, in the fires. So uh, what's the plan for when people don't have those communication infrastructures? And, and then how are, we, how are we making sure our existing communications infrastructure work? And then for people who don't have access to, uh, to phones or landlines, how are we gonna evacuate them? So there's, so there's a couple of, of things that we're gonna be doing. So we're gonna be um, you know, hopefully going out with the, um, with the supervisor, so Supervisor McPherson, Supervisor Community out into the, the community um, to kind of let people, give them a better sense of, of which evacuation zones are in um, and get a sense of what people have, you know, if they have a landline, if they have a cell phone, um, we also are, we have a request into the state right now to get weather radios so we can hand those out to people if they don't have any other lines of communication. There's some that you can, you can crank up and have batteries and, and listen to that. Um, there's just, and hopefully we'll have neighborhood leads that can get the message out to people. Um, there's, there's just the, we're just going to have to kind of rely on kind of old fashioned kind of word of mouth on, on in some areas as well. And that's why on the, you know, I kind of mentioned in the, in the previous slide that you can't always rely on, on us. So we want people to be proactive and, and talk to their neighbors and, and talk to their friends, um, watch the news, you know, listen to the radio about the, you know, stay alert as far as what the, the weather predictions are gonna be. And um, following up on that for people who may be uh, elderly or have uh, illness or don't have cars, um, are we making a plan for people who don't have transportation? And then also, where will people go? Uh, there was concern on here that uh, insurance coverage may not cover hotel rooms for debris flow where it would cover it for fire. Um, and so they're worried about the financial impact. So um, at the meeting that we had today, we did have health, health services in that meeting as well with AMR. So there's, there's talks that's part of the evacuation planning that the first responders are gonna be doing. Um, and so there's gonna be a lot of, um, you know, probably a lot of door to door where we're going to be asking people about um, what are their needs? Do they, are they going to need help evacuating that sort of thing? So we can, so we can prepare for that. Um, and then what was the second part to that one, right? The second part is uh, where will people be evacuated to? And there's some concern that, um, that, it, that hotel rooms may not be covered by people's insurance in this instance. Uh, and so uh, there's a finance, potential financial impact to people who, who are evacuating and needing to go uh, to hotels? So right now we, um, we haven't quite landed on all of the, the evacuation areas as well. Um, and we'll be working with, with the state, um, state agencies and FEMA as far as whether or not the hotels are gonna be reimbursed and, and so forth. So that's gonna be um, kind of more information to come on that. Okay, yeah, and I, I believe in a conversation we are talking about earlier that this may be covered, people may be covered under the fire event from a FEMA perspective uh, if, if they're then if, if impacted by debris flows. Uh, perhaps, Willie, you can uh, speak to that. I think you're muted still, Mr. Nunn. If you're still muted, there you go. Oops, there, there you go. There you yes, go. Sir. Um, sorry about that. Yes, um, uh, sir. The uh, with it, if it's if it can be connected as a part of a, a continuation of this this fire event, as for the brief flows, uh, I was looking at I was listening to the question as far as as far as uh, if if we could if they had expenses for uh, the ho the hotels. Um, right now, we're working with the Cal OES with the with the with the non-congregate shelters. Uh, that may be a part of it as they as they go into a shelter as they evacuate. Uh, that would be from the PA side of the house and not to not to the individual themselves, but working with Cal OES for that. And then again, this uh, uh, I have to look at past events. Uh, does this rise to the level of a new event? And so I would have to look at that as well. Um, 
Thank you. And I think uh, following up, just, just one more question about uh, debris flows, which is there's concern about, uh, first of all, people who are maybe up on a ridge needing to evacuate down through a valley that may be dangerous or on various roads that are currently half washed out or maybe washed out. Um, specifically, there's a question about Alba Road. Um, and so how will people get out if uh, in terms, if there's already a problem with, with access or roads? So the thing with, with the debris flows and the weather systems that are coming in, we should know days in advance um, when, when, these are, when these events are, are coming. Um, and we're hoping to get the debris flow um, evacuation orders out you know, 24 hours plus in advance. So, um, so there should be plenty of time. That's going to be part of the evacuation planning that the first responders are, are going, to be, going to be doing. And so that, that messaging will, will be coming out as once the, once the geologic team kind of finishes the mapping, then that's really when the, the law and fire folks will be sitting around or sitting together and working on the, the evacuation plans. Okay, thank you. We'll be doing a lot more, both Supervisor McPherson and I, along with emergency and public works staff, will be doing a lot more outreach right. uh, to, for people to respond to, to these concerns. Supervisor McPherson, did you have yeah. some questions? Yeah, there might, uh, this might be for uh, uh, Mr. Nunn. Uh, when do you think the phase two cleanup will start uh, with FEMA? And what is involved for this to happen? Uh, a, brief, a brief description would be helpful. And sir, the, the, as Ryan said when he, began, when he began this, my biggest role in this is to make sure it was approved. And he starts setting up the contracts and making sure when this gets started. Um, my role in this, as I see it right now, is support making sure that uh, uh, coordinating with Ryan, making sure what the actions that are being taken are within the program so that we're not going outside the bounds. Uh, Ryan, I, I turn that back to you on the timelines. Yeah, there's one thing, I guess uh, Mr. Kellogg is uh, from EPA is on the line now too. Maybe not. No. Mr. Kellogg from EPA is on the line, I believe. Okay. Supervisor, if you wanted to ask him a question, he could unmute his uh, phone. Yeah, and uh, you can hear can me. Can you hear me? Yeah, we can now. Okay. Uh, uh, the, question, question. the question was, when do you think uh, cleanup will uh, start with FEMA and what, what's, the, what's involved for that to happen? Uh, just a brief description for people to know what's going to be coming in their neighborhood. Uh, so the, the, the post-fire debris cleanup is in two phases and phase one began uh, last week. Uh, phase one is being done in Santa Cruz County by EPA, and um, we are um, uh, pretty much up to full steam right now and uh, working in in the Highway 9 corridor, uh, Boulder Creek and North, and over in Swanton and Bonadune areas. Um, and uh, we will continue uh, over the coming days and weeks. Now, if the property had hazard material, uh, including commercial properties, uh, uh, would they be eligible for county-sponsored phase two program? I, I think that's that's a county question. I, I the phase one is is uh, strongly encouraged by county environmental health, and um, and it, it allows them to then get into the phase. Uh, the next phase of work, uh, and it, that, that it ultimately becomes a property owner's decision on which way they want to go. Okay. Uh, go ahead, Brian, if you had another question. Yeah, so, um, I mean, I think uh, on phase two, if we could just talk about, um, there, was a, there was talk that we got approved today, we're very grateful, uh, and um, when that might occur, how people, uh, uh, we'll, could, can sign up for it, and then um, the uh, then there was questions about uh, what happens if the property is not accessible uh, through uh, from danger 
from uh, damage from the to access roads. Marilyn Underwood, do you want to maybe answer these questions? Well, I think I could take a stab at a few of them. Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. Um, so having just heard about phase two, which is we're very happy to hear about it after um, and appreciate that uh, assistance. So we'll be getting a right of entry form. It is something that we work with the state um, agencies that are gonna be uh, uh, doing the work we think. Um, it's certainly something they need their lawyers to agree upon and our lawyers will take a look at it. So as soon as we get an agreement on that right of entry, we will be putting that up on our website um, so that people can start to um, take part in that program. It will take a while for them to get staged here and I can't really speak to that. I think we've heard that it might take them a month to get up and running. But during that time, we will be processing those right of entry uh, um, uh, forms. So more to come on that. Yesterday, we were able to populate our website with the private contractor approach because as soon as people have a phase one approach, uh, cleanup done, they can opt into the private contractor. Uh, those documents are all up on our website and we will be begin if you, uh, we have a, several different processes as to how you can submit that information. And then once you do that, we'll start processing those next week to allow people to move ahead with the private contractor option. Um, as far as the access issues that you raised, Supervisor Coonerty, um, on private roads, I really don't, can't speak to that right now. I did hear that at some point, I thought you, Steve may be able to speak to that. Um, I did hear that they put down temporary bridges just to be able to access properties. Um, and then, uh, you know, they don't leave them there, but maybe they leave them for phase two. But I did understand that they put those down, I believe, for even phase one. So that might be part of the question that Steve could answer. Um, Marilyn, from what I understand, uh, up in the private roads, particularly in the western part of the county, um, a lot of the residents uh, have been very um, cooperative and, and helpful with our teams and, and really kind of giving them the, the lay of the land and guiding them in. So um, there may very well have been temporary bridges built uh, to gain access to the property. I, I know there's a close coordination with the residents up there with our teams and uh, they're working hand in hand to get into these properties and get the work done. I, I would, I would uh, suggest that folks uh, who uh, may be on one of these inaccessible roads call into the number provided by uh, Cal EPA so that they can uh, coordinate with Cal EPA to, to get access. Let me just point out, we have federal US EPA helping us here. Okay. Cal EPA is another entity and they will probably be, I don't know that for sure, but be part of the phase two but it is United States Environmental Protection Agency that are sent. Okay. We have a regional office in San Francisco here that these guys are from Great. and gals. Um, we have a series of questions about trees. trees so, yeah. uh, does FEMA phase two include trees? Does it include coming back again to scrape the soils uh, or found to after the toxic debris, initial toxic debris is removed? Um, is, uh, uh, what will happen, yeah, what's going to happen with trees, and then also I know that there's PG&E is, uh, is cutting trees, uh, CAL FIRE is cutting trees, and now the county is looking at um, uh, cutting trees along roadways. Matt Machado, do you want to talk trees? Yeah, sure. Good evening, everybody. So uh, as Ryan described, there really are three components to the trees. There's trees that PG&E are cutting down to uh, create the ways for them. Uh, we're certainly pushing PG&E to, to clean up after themselves. Uh, they are their own entity, so that's not a perfect system, but I, I have seen them haul a lot of trees, uh, the debris. They are grinding some in place. Uh, we'll have to continue to, to impress upon them to do the cleanup work after the trees are down. Uh, the county's efforts, uh, we are assessing the trees along county rights of way and even those trees that are right on the edge of the right of way that are on private property or but that are within the fall zone of the roadway. That effort is underway. Uh, we're wrapping up that um, assessment in the Swanton Road area and then we'll be next moving into the Felton Empire area. We think that's going to take another four weeks to get that assessment completely done. We will be reaching out to parcel owners uh, to address those trees that are 
on private property, but are very close to the public right of way, and we believe will affect the public right of way to get uh, your permission to remove those trees. But those are only the ones that we have marked. For um, for perspective, the Swanton Road area, we've identified about a thousand hazardous trees. So it's a very very large task. And then the last segment of trees, those trees that are uh, absolutely on private property, away from roadways, away from the public right of way, those trees, if they are in, um, if they're uh, posing imminent threat to the debris removal process, those crews will mitigate those trees, but only if they're imminent threat, meaning the trees on the verge of falling down and threatening the work uh, being done as part of the cleanup. Beyond that, uh, there is not a, a process to for for um, our phase one, phase two partners to remove trees that are are not deemed imminent threat or on the verge of falling down. So that will be then the responsibility of the parcel owners uh, after the cleanup. Okay, uh, do do people have to apply for FEMA for phase two? Yes, reapplying us. Marilyn, you're, you're not, you want to take that one? Sure, yeah. So because there's two options, the fa the, um, and we need a right of entry. So the phase one is occurring under an emergency order from this governor. So the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency who are doing phase one do not need a right of entry to go into the property and remove the hazard, household hazardous waste, the block asbestos. But in the case of the phase two, we do need folks to opt in and if in opting in, they give a right of entry to for the public option, or they can tell us they're going to use a, a private contractor and apply and a, submit an application for use of a private contractor. So yes, there is a process to choose one or the other. Actually, I should say there's a third option. For those properties that might have a burned, the house is intact, uh, and the only thing burned may be a shed of 120 square feet or less, then those folks can apply to us get, to get an exemption. And you say, why would you involve the government to need an exemption? It turns out when you're arriving at a landfill with ash debris, they're gonna want to know how, if you're allowed to bring it to them. And so um, by saying to us and telling us that you have a shed that's exempt, we will be um, stamping your, essentially your application and returning it to you you can take that to the landfill and tell them that you um, are allowed to bring that ash debris from a 120 square foot less sh a shed or less that doesn't have hazardous waste in it. Uh, so there's really three options. And then Bruce, if I could add in on that, um, I, it sounded like part of your question was uh, whether people have to apply for that. We, the county will be coming to you as part of phase two. Uh, and so that sign up effort is part of that right of entry. Just to be clear that we'll, the county would be coming to you for the phase two uh, cleanup options. Okay, very good. So uh, we have a number of questions about uh, phase two um, that uh, people still have. Uh, first is, uh, the first question was, is, it, is phase two subsidized? And uh, I can let somebody answer that. Um, and then the second question is, uh, for people who are proceeding, who want to proceed with a private option, uh, how soon can they do that and what do they need to do uh, to proceed with that option? Okay, let me take a stab at that. So as far as the first question about the public option being subsidized, it is essentially an option that we're, this is why it took so long in, in a way, is that FEMA and Office of Emergency Services had to agree to what was going to be covered uh, because those costs are, for the most part, going to be covered under FEMA. If a person signs up for uh, a public option and they had insurance that included a debris removal uh, aspect to their insurance, they will need to disclose that to the county. Um, and so some, if not all, of that debris removal um, co uh, coverage from insurance will be uh, sought by the county. Now, if there's no insurance or no debris insurance coverage, then it would be fully funded under the FEMA, the OES funding. So that's the public option. Under the private contractor option, those documents and ability to start that process are already available on our website. Um, and so you can download the application, you can fill it out, actually hope to, hopefully tomorrow, you can actually fill it out online um, using your own legal signature and submit it to us. Uh, directly to us, it would be fed into that system. 
uh, you will need to identify a work a contractor that you're working with, with uh, and they will need to supply a work plan. We do have a, a model work plan on our website so the contractor can choose that one and just fill it in and supply it back to us. As soon as we review those, we're gonna start reviewing them uh, next week. We will let you know, and then the contractor can proceed uh, with the cleanup. And one follow-up question is, uh, people with the yellow tags, uh, are they gonna get phase one cleanup or is it just those with red tags? Steve, you wanna take that one or you want me to? So in the absence of Steve answering, let me, do, let me let you know what I think is happening and how uh, US EPA has been very open to this. We had some information from Butte County and this is what we've all been operating on is kind of, you know, Butte County was the last big fire, campfire last year. They have a very nice chart of what was covered in phase one and phase two. Um, and certainly those items, are, uh, for instance, any, any structure doesn't have to, as long as there's some, how many walls are standing or some of these rules um, are, they cover, they want to take out the household hazardous waste. They want to help you, the property owner, be able to take, go to the next step. So I know US EPA has been very open to trying to get household hazardous waste from any type of uh, structure where that exists. But let me let Steve weigh in on that because now I see him. Hi, Steve. Oops, we can't, we can't hear you, Steve. Uh -oh. Come on, we wanna hear you. <laughs> All right, well, Steve figures out the sound. Um, uh, I guess, uh, Kent, let's, let's go back to debris flows real quick, which is, uh, Kent, there's a lot of concern about debris flows. Um, and uh, people are talking about, is there any superficial erosion control measures they can take? And also, if, they, if those measures are expensive, uh, is there any support on, um, for them to take that if, they, if it might impact their watershed, a watershed? So the... Um... The erosion control is not really going to help with the with the debris flow hazards. Um, so throwing out the throwing out seed and, and doing that sort of thing is is not really going to help. Right? There's 86,000 acres burned, um, and some of these watersheds are you know thousand acres plus. Um, so the erosion control is not really going to help with the debris flow. So we just that's why we're messaging people to to get out of the way um, and to evacuate. Um, and then the second part was about um, was about assistance for for the erosion control measures. Is that what it was? Yeah, about? if 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 they're near a watershed and they want to take some measures to help reduce uh, debris flow into that watershed, um, but they can't afford it, is there is there any public support, perhaps from the RCD? Yeah, I was going to say that contact the, the resource conservation district. Um, they might be able to to lend some support on that. Hey, Ryan, if I could add in there, uh, the county just uh, posted a really great summary of um, of erosion control measures for water quality purposes, not for debris flow. And it was in coordination with the RCD and a number of county departments. It's a very good uh, um, how to and uh, and I. I think the one of the fears that people have is is doing some of these measures, these best management practices on their property, even though their home burned. And what we're suggesting is don't get onto the debris site of the home. Don't disturb that, but you can protect around it because we all want to protect the watershed and the water quality. And so absolutely you can you can um uh put measures onto your land as long as it doesn't deserve uh um disturb the debris itself from the home site. And so go to the county's website and there's a great, it's about a 12 pager, but it's really um, user friendly. Okay, um, will landowners be uh, notified when their property is going to be evaluated by geologists? And we only have one geologist in Santa Cruz County, I think. So we're gonna have some people come in that we don't know, I guess, but will they be, uh, notified 
As, as far as um, if they're in a debris flow hazard area? Yeah, I, I would assume that's what the question, the person wanted to know, yeah. So it's, um, we'll try to get out. I mean, it's, a lot of it's gonna come down to the evacuation plan that the, the first responders are, are gonna do. So um, they're gonna try to go door to door, but that, that the evacuation planning hasn't been developed yet. So we're really trying to encourage people to go to the county's website. Um, you, you go onto the homepage, it's under the fire recovery link and then there's the reflow um, and, and lead flows link on there where people can look and that map is going to be posted on there. So people should look at that when that's up and that should be hopefully in about another week, or maybe a little bit longer um, when that, when that's up there. Um, and then we're going to, the, the talk is that we're going to try to get people out on you know, boots on the ground to go, go door to door and start talking to people that are in these areas. But there, there's going to be, there's going to be a lot of homes. So it's going to be a lot of area to cover. So I, and I, I don't want to promise that. Uh, you know, the, the evacuation roads, wherever they may be, and there's big questions about Alba Road in particular in my district, if that can be used as an evacuation road because trees in, in just about any storm, let alone this one, the kind we've had this year, fall on that road. Um, I, I guess that plan of evacuation, if that should be closed, there'll be options that will be spelled out. Is that right? Yeah, I'll take that one, Kent. And so... Um... When we look at the evacuation plan, we're absolutely looking at the evacuation routes. Um, we understand the constraints and you're right. Uh, many of those roads are, are very um, precarious during the winter and a normal winter. And so this winter, it's gonna be extra challenging. We will be looking at all evacuation routes. Uh, we had that conversation today and we know that some of these um, I'll call them private roads that we could use on a normal year and working with the landowners. Some of those are not accessible during the winter and rains. So we're going to be very careful um, the selected evacuation routes and we're gonna try to plan for all the different um, hazards that we're gonna see, but we, we don't have that plan yet. Uh, we do plan to bring a presentation to the Board of Supervisors, hopefully in uh, November to to share that evacuation plan and look at those evacuation routes and look at our plan A and plan B. Um, there's probably not a perfect solution for yeah. any of it, but we're gonna, we'll share uh, quite right. soon what we think the best plan is. Yeah, and how, how many properties per day roughly are being processed during phase one? I think there was uh, 43, wait a minute, no, I don't know if that was property. But, but how many properties are, are being processed during phase one right now? So, Supervisor, this is Steve Kalinagi, EPA. Uh, hopefully you can hear me. Um, yes, um, so, as of uh, this afternoon, I, I, my understanding of the numbers coming in, we've, from beginning last week, we've done about uh, just over 150 phase one completes um, in, uh, in our area of, of operations in Santa Cruz County. Okay. Do, do you think... Uh, is, is that, well, what, how many per day can you, I don't know how many staff you have out there. Uh, what, what's so, it's rough territory, I know, but. Yeah, yes, sir. Well, our team out in the field is, is just under 100 folks, divided uh, about over about 12 different teams. Um, we are starting in, in some of the more densely uh, situated um uh, residential neighborhoods where homes are fairly close to each other and we're, we're getting through those those communities fairly quick the challenge as you already alluded to is is accessing the more remote and mountainous properties um, and uh, as was also mentioned some of the uh, access along the the private roads with uh, felled trees among other things um, will will slow us down uh, but um, uh, we're moving along steadily very good, okay. Um, let's see, let me think. Um, if, uh, if a person w was not red tagged, it sounds like there would be uh, no level one. And if you have no level one cleanup, does the county know about you for level two cleanup? Steve, can you talk to that whole issue of what's covered? It's, it's not- Yeah. Just, yeah, okay, thank you. 
I, I guess I'm, I'm, I'm a little uh, uncertain of, the, of, of the, your particular vernacular here. So even if a primary residence was not completely or, or even in, uh, damaged at all, but outbuildings, barns, sheds, work, um, work areas were, were impacted and there are, is has hazardous materials in there, we will um, we'll remove them because they still do present a, a threat to human health and the environment. So um, I think that that probably explains or answers the question that homes may not be red tagged in and of themselves, but we'll still be doing work there. Okay. Um, let's see. Uh, does uh, the phase two right of entry, does that request come to the landowner by mail or? Marilyn, you're muted. Darn it. Um, let's see. So um, we will be posting a right of entry form on our website, and we'll be trying to get people. We do have a listserv of a lot of people that came to our resource recovery center. We'll be trying to reach out to people. We're doing email, I mean, a media blast to try to get the folks that have parcels uh, that should be participating in phase two the knowledge that they now need to choose between the right of entry, uh, the public option and the private option. So we will, or, or potentially the exemption option. So we will be reaching out to people in various methods, but essentially they do need to be able to fill out the form forms, whichever approach they take and, and supply those back to us. Does that kind of answer your question? Yes, it does. Okay. Uh, Steve, how do, how do property owners know that uh, phase one has been completed on their property? Well, that, that's done in a variety of different ways. Um, it's kind of a belt and suspenders approach. Um, uh, the most obvious visible thing is, is that we'll, we'll post a placard. It almost looks like a, um, uh, an, insure, <laughs> uh, uh, an election sign in, in, the, in the property that says EPA has completed phase one. And if there's any questions, we direct them to county uh, for follow-up questions. But we also will and, and do have a public uh facing a uh, web uh gis viewer that's uh on the county websites and uh that our information is uploaded there daily uh you can the community can see where we're working uh each and every day and um when we complete the property uh the phase one complete we will post that up there too so uh, a property owner can type in their address to see what the status of their property is and, and lastly the third third approach is, is that they will be notified either by the county or, or uh, with the assistance of epa in in the form of a letter or, or other forms of communication that phase one is complete so we'll, we try and catch it a couple different ways and steve um there's a question about uh is there an idea to get a rough schedule of when the phase one cleanup might uh, might come to your property? Yeah, generally um, uh, on the website now, which is already loaded, uh, um, linked from the county website, and, and there's a tab there, or not a tab, you scroll down and you see where are we working. Generally, we've divided up the Santa Cruz area into 16 work zones. And generally, we're moving from uh, it, wherever we are today or tomorrow, we'll generally move to the next uh, zone, adjacent zone in the in the coming day or, or week. So um, you residents will see our teams out there um, and, and they're they're at, invited to talk to the team leads to, to really gauge um, when they think the teams may be coming to their neighborhoods. Uh, but that website will also be there. And of course, if you're there, there's the hotline that I saw was posted. You can also call and and see if um, if they can get some more um, clarity on dates as well. So there, again, a couple different ways of providing their information to the community. And if people uh, obviously know their homes were damaged or uh, are gone, but they're not on the damage assessment website and they want to make sure that they're included in phase one cleanup, how do they do that? Well, again, the hotline is the, probably the best way. Um, also reaching out to the county, uh, uh, Maryland's agency or, or public works, Matt's. Um, uh, we get that information. So we're, we're coordinating closely with the county agencies and um, um, we have this constant dialogue and those types of properties and issues come forward, are brought forward to us on, on a daily basis. So uh, do you have that number you wanna give out? 
I saw somebody post it here on the chat. Let me see if I – it is 415-793-8749. That's the EPA hotline for this. Thank you. Uh, we have um, several county service areas um, and roads that are in danger. Um, the guardrails uh, and so forth, uh, they've contacted the county and uh, they have yet to receive an answer regarding the emergency needs. Uh, how will they be addressed? Do they have to go through a, a different or some kind of a separate process? I think we have about, what, a dozen or 14 CSAs. I think, Matt, do you, something of that nature? Yeah. So, Bruce, um, we are working with the CSA representatives, and so we're coordinating uh, whether they need a damage assessment or if they just need help working through the reimbursement process for, um, for permanent restoration or if they had some um, storm damage um, interim improvements that they provided. And so if, if that question is uh, from a particular CSA that doesn't seem to be in the know, I'm happy to coordinate with them directly, but our team has been working with a number of those CSAs and answering questions and helping them through the process. Uh, most of those CSAs are no stranger to disaster recovery with uh, storm damage in the past. Um, so I, I think that answered the question, but if okay. there's an unanswered question there, let me know. Okay, no, I think that's, uh... Uh, and there's a question about the, in the valleys to, to distinguish the, the danger zones. Uh, I mean, if there's if people on the ridge tops, uh, they might be okay just staying put and not going down to the valleys where the flow is going. Um, should there, uh, is there a difference uh, about the notice that might be coming out if you live on a ridge top uh, compared to down on the gorges or the valleys? I don't know if that fits, um, or it, if they did that in Montecito, if people stayed up top, if they were up in the top of the ridge, instead of trying to go down to where the danger zone is happening. Um, I don't I think some people just want some advice of what they should do, what they should stay at their ridge tops or go down to where the flow is going. Do you wanna, do you wanna get that one, Matt, or do you want me to, to answer it? Uh, sure, I'll, I'll take a run at it. So. Okay. <clears throat> Bruce, you know, as we develop these evacuation maps, they're going to be careful to draw the lines. And if someone's in that lined area, we want them to evacuate and we'll, we'll work on those evacuation routes. Um, I would seriously doubt we would direct somebody to the top of the mountain because they're going to be cut off and they could be cut off for many, many days and it could become a rescue issue for us. We don't want that. We don't want to have to right. go up there and rescue people because they're stranded now. So I would seriously doubt we would do that, but um, I think uh, you know the maps and the evacuation routes will will cover good direction for everybody. It would be great to get those maps, and I know you're working on it really well too. So that's good. Thanks. Um, for for phase two, um, for phase two cleanup, does it matter whether the home is owned by uh, an individual or a business? Um, does that impact the eligibility for phase two? Hmm. Um, that's an interesting question. I'm not quite sure. I don't know that it would, but to be honest with you, I, I shouldn't. I know that they even have in the past, and certainly in Butte, uh, they also did small businesses. So, uh, you know, commercial property, small businesses. So I'm not, I guess, to be honest with you, I think we might need to wait till the details come out from the letter that we're getting from OES. Um, to, to really specifically answer that. Okay. Uh, Mr. Nunn, do you want to talk about hazard mitigation programs and what we can do to make our community uh, more resilient? Yes, sir. Um, uh, just, just real quick on the, on the, uh, the, the uh, Ms. Uh, Ms. Marilyn is right. Uh, uh, I don't see anything about the, the, the commercial buildings right now. But uh, as we look more into the details of that, we'll see what is actually eligible and not eligible of that. But uh, sort of uh, hazard mitigation, uh, definitely with, uh, with the, as we get into the public assistance program, working with Cal OES, working with the, each of the local uh, uh, infrastructure folks, uh, when they work on their uh, individual projects, uh, we always look at uh, uh, hazard mitigation, what we call the full six uh, mitigation, Whatever is damaged, whichever is eligible damage, we look at putting in dollars for mitigation for those particular projects. 
Uh, and we also like to look at uh, when we're when we're looking at a, a concentrated area, if 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 that community or that applicant have a plan already of what they of what their future plan, if they were impacted, looking at as we not only we re, we we put it like it was, but the opportunity to put it better and more resilient. So and that's too is a part of for, of the PA program, uh, as Ryan well know, the 428 program that we have. Uh, where, we, where we're looking at how, how can we, we put dollars, mitigation dollars into this, into what was damaged, and also put mitigation dollars on top of it. Um, and so, and, and a lot of this sort of could also be a part of the, the longer term 404, which we work with Cal OES, working with Ryan in the state, of which particular projects the community may want to work on uh, at that time uh, to make sure we get the mitigation dollars that coming from this entire disaster uh, focus on the right place. I, I might answer a question um, with um, Underwood is with the Environmental Health Department of the county. There was a question, uh, and then it said, "Where's the website uh, for when Phase One will be on their property?" I think somebody may have answered that, but I, there's another question. So, if uh, about that, where is the website? Where can people find uh, when the Phase One will be on their property? Well, first of all, it's not, uh, maybe Steve going to speak some more. I can show, I think I'm allowed to share screen. I can show the, um, the website that I have up. And, but just to, again, the, I always tell people the easiest way to find all the information is go to Santa Cruz County website. At the very top, we have a banner called fire. When you click that fire, you can choose debris removal. You can, uh, maps is another function right up there. And that will get you to some of these links that we're talking about. But um, let me just see if I can share. Oh, I can't. Unless JM lets me um, share a screen, I won't be able to show you that map. But uh, that's really the best, easiest way to get to it. Okay. Thank you. Alan, we uh, have the link in the uh, chat there. Uh, there's a concern that phase two with topsoil scraping sounds ominous and like it'll break the soil crust that the Resource Conservation District says must be left intact. Could you describe the process more clearly? Uh, so it's hard, uh, I guess people wanna know what that, who makes the determination about how much soil will be taken away and what's that, uh, what's the process likely to be like? Yeah, so again, I am not the expert here. I just can tell you, I've talked to my colleagues in my other counties where this has already occurred so the idea is that people have heard that certainly many, several years ago, Sonoma County had uh, an agency, the Army Corps of Engineer that was overseeing phase two and they were actually paying their contractors by the ton to remove material. So unfortunately they took too much. Uh, and so if you've heard those horror stories, it's true. They took too much soil. This is not the intent in what, as my understanding has happened subsequent to those years and all these other places where they've had fires. Below the foundation there is heavy metals in the so topsoil. And so they take away somewhere, I'm, I've been told three to six inches uh, underneath the structure of the home. Again, this is not the entire property. Um, and again, that's probably where the structure would be replaced, right? So that's the amount of topsoil that they take. And again, the interest is not to take too much soil because then you might have to, in, in the Sonoma County case, they actually had to bring soil back in. Um, so it is not a lot of soil and that's, that's uh, obviously you don't want to end up paying your contractor per ton because that's not the right incentive. And, and uh, Mr. McPherson, this is Willie. Uh, just as Marilyn said, I'm here, uh, uh, my, my lights went out. I, I did pay my power bill here. <laughs> <laughs> um, but uh, the, the, we're looking at the letter. It says removal of the surface ash, which maybe includes three to six inches of incidental soil prior to the removal of the of the of foundations if you're moving that. So uh, being the person not out there actually doing it, but that's the starting point of what we look at. Okay. Uh, so this is a question for Steve. Um, the, uh, some folks are saying, you know, they have big properties and, and your teams might not know where there might be hazardous debris that burned um, how much uh, interaction do you want? Uh, do, you, do you want property owners helping you 
helping to point that out one way or another? Uh, how, how, how's that conversation happening? Uh, the short answer is yes. Um, if, um, if they're not able to, if they don't have the opportunity to encounter our teams out in the field in their neighborhoods, uh, to call the hot, hotline and provide that information to, uh, to us that way. Um, we, we get a lot of information from property owners on where to find things uh, that would need to be removed. Uh, I think what's we're finding here in particular is a lot of off the grid solar, um, solar systems have a, a wide array of um, marine cell uh, batteries that uh, are, are not in the most obvious locations and it's been residents and property owners that pointed us to, to, to remove them because they were damaged by the fire. So yes, uh, we, we welcome any information. Great. And so by mostly by calling the, the hotline and letting people know your address and, and the, the, what you can do to help. Or if you, if you see a team drive through the neighborhood, f please flag them down uh, and, um, and they'll, they'll take notes, na names and numbers and contact you for additional information to, and, and, uh, and follow up with that property owner. Yeah. Uh, Marilyn from Environmental Health. Uh, should people on private wells without damaged water systems have their water tested for contamination in the aquifer? I would say no. So you said a well was not damaged. Yeah. Uh, and uh, they're pulling from their aquifer. No, we wouldn't necessarily recommend that. Okay. Um, I don't know. Uh, maybe Mr. Nunn, there was a question about FEMA's national flood insurance program. I guess that's assuming if there's a debris flow and people have damage from that uh, flood like instance. Um, I, I don't know. I'm not sure how this, um, you know, is relates to directly to the fire, but maybe it's just because it's, uh, if, if somebody is flooded with uh, de debris, uh, does FEMA cover something like that? I, I think that's what the, the questioner would like to know. Yes, sir. And that would, that would depend on the type of uh, national flood insurance policy that it would have, sir. Um, uh, I'm not familiar with the, uh, uh, with the flood insurance program caused by debris flow, uh, but since this is this is in, in relationship with rain and with, with potential uh, flooding that could happen, so that would de all depend on the type of policy that they would have uh, with the net, uh, and what's in that national flood insurance policy. Uh, I'd like to ask uh, Mr. Burris. Uh, we've uh, gone easy on you tonight, but you're a key partner. <laughs> Uh, in all this, uh, is there, can, would you like to give us any information about phase two or hazard mitigation um, or the other efforts Cal OES is making in this, in this effort? Sure, thanks, uh, Ryan. Um, I know a lot has been discussed and I just wait for my turn, so I'll keep this <laughs> brief and uh, it's, your, it's your town hall. So um, just, just uh, you know, California, the way it works is it's a little different than it works in other areas uh, in the U.S. Uh, Cal OES takes a prominent role in response and recovery. We partner closely with the federal government, but we take a much bigger hand. We truly believe things are disastrous start locally and end locally. Uh, so we work with the local government to support them uh, through Cal OES, and then FEMA supports us in any way they can and get an approval of levers. I mean, letters on phase two, I mean, phase one, uh, we're doing it several places, I mean, like several different ways in the state, just for clarity. Uh, we have US EPA working in Santa Cruz, Monterey, San Mateo, Santa Clara, and we have the Department of Toxic and Substance Control working in a lot of the other areas in the state, and we had to do that because, um, which is a state agency, and we had to do that just because of the complexities of cleaning the debris from the Mexican border to Oregon. So uh, in this particular county, we use US EPA, and we Mission tasked them through the federal government, and uh, we're really appreciative that the US EPA was able to do this uh, and speed up uh, your recovery uh, here there. Phase two, uh, I, I heard Marilyn mention some things about the Omicron of engineers that was done in 17. 17 was a pilot uh, we decided to do in California. Uh, we decided to take a few counties on ourselves and let the Omicron of engineers take some counties uh, just to see how we can do working through Cal Recycle, which is a sister uh, department under U, uh, US, uh, under EPA, state EPA. 
uh, it went really well. We kept costs down. Uh, we were able to control a lot of the over scraping and backfills. Uh, so we decided in 18 to take it on entirely ourselves. Uh, we removed over 560,000 tons of debris in 18. That's equivalent. Uh, I'm sorry, we, we removed over 560,000 elephants of debris uh, in 18, just for uh, a visual of what that is. We did that. We started that disaster was November. We started that debris uh, mission uh, at the beginning of February, and we concluded November 6, which was less than a year. And just for comparison, that was about 18,000 structures. So we decided the state can take this on for phase two. Uh, we will be the responsible party for, uh, for, for this activity, working closely uh, with the counties. The, it starts with the right of entry. Well, first off, it starts with the approval. So Willie, thanks you, thank you for that. It does start with the right of entries that I'll be working with uh, our chief counsel tomorrow to hopefully get this wrapped up so we can start these right of entries. Uh, the right of entries is central because we have to show and provide that information to FEMA uh, to where everything is eligible. Uh, we, we're working with a contract that we hope to get on the street in the next week or so, uh, bid uh, and, and get several contracts on the street. We have four branches. This is uh, gonna be very difficult. And uh, so we've been working closely with uh, debris. There was a comment on commercial property. Commercial property is a very complex issue. This is something that the public assistance team from state and uh, the federal government can work with the county and depending on insurance and the owner's capability of repaying that back. And there's a, there's a story there. We just have to meet together. And if there's a request from the county coming up, Willie and myself will take that up and see if we can uh, work on those individual commercial or business properties. Uh, but businesses are, you know, uh, there's this little complexity there and our teams will work closely for that. Um, for hazard mitigation, uh, once again, um, there's two types of mitigation. Well, there's several types of mitigation. There's public assistance mitigation, where all projects get 15% of, uh, well, up to 15% of mitigation dollars. So, a, you know, a $10,000 project, you can get $1,500 to mitigate it. You know, there is a cost share to that of 25%. Uh, we do have hazard mitigation, which is the 404 program. Uh, which typically you, you, you know, not to get into, and, and Ryan, I hope I'm not getting too much detail, but yeah. uh, um, there's on the uh, 404 program, um, uh, once you lock in a number, whatever this massive disaster is going to be, uh, typically we, we have a notice of intent. Each county gives us, or cities gives us projects, and we submit projects to FEMA. FEMA reviews them in the region. One thing I want to do here, and I've been you know, I'm actually sitting right now in a hotel in Monterey because I was in Santa Cruz yesterday and I'm trying to visit all the areas that, over this week, but is how do we best get something, money now in the street? Let's not wait another year. Let's see how, if there's projects that y'all have in the making uh, that's not, not so focused on the environmental side. It's, it's a quick win for all of you, uh, for your local uh, leaders uh, and, 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 and get some quick wins in the street. Willie and I will work with the region and get these approved. This is something that we try and do uh, uh, closely uh, with you all. So it's, uh, it's, it's a big story. OES is definitely a big part in this, uh, working with all of you. Uh, and you know, uh, mitigation to me, I have a goal of every disaster, every public assistance project, we should 100%, uh, particularly C through G, which is roads and bridges and whatever was damaged, should have mitigation dollars to it. And if, it, if we can't be done, let's move to file where we can't do it. But let's not leave any federal dollars on the table that can help uh, your, uh, your uh, constituents, Board of Supervisors uh, here and your local leaders. Uh, and we're, we have a wonder part, you know, wonderful partnership. So uh, there's a lot of complexities. And, um, but as you can tell, um, I'm here, uh, the team's here. We have Kendra Boyer that's dedicated, that's actually behind me socially distancing. Also with Bob Troy with me today and tonight, and we'll be here, as I said, throughout this. And a lot of these questions are, you know, they're going to be, they're very difficult to answer, definitely on a, a our chat, uh, but they were all wonderful questions. Phase one, phase two, debris, we're going to go into housing in the future, uh, and we're ready to support you, uh, Ryan and Bruce and uh, everyone. And we feel really good about uh, the support system we've gotten from FEMA and OES. I'm telling you, it's great. There's one, it's not a question so much as it is uh, a comment about, and it's just a, or a concern about communications. You know, there are some areas here without communications that have been impacted. And uh, I do want to make clear the, this, the office that uh, Supervisor Coonerty and I proposed and was unanimously approved is recovery, which is the immediate thing we have to do, but it's resiliency. We want along with what we're doing 
uh, we, we aim to say, okay, what do we have to do to make this uh, um, less complicated, less uh, and better communication in our areas is going to be important in that regard. And so that's the type of a subject matter that we will be discussing with this Office of Recovery and Resiliency. So I, uh, we, it's recovery right now, but uh, we want to get, it's going to be a long-term uh, resilient effort too. That's what we're after. And I just want to, uh, just, just wrapping up here, I want to thank, I mean, all the federal and state partners. Um, Cal OES was here from the moment uh, the fire hit and have been asking what they can do to help. FEMA has been great. I drive by uh, their station uh, every day, every night on my way home. Um, and they're there and accessible. Um, and then all of our partners uh, and then the um, EPA out cleaning as we speak in not easy areas to access, uh, but making sure we get that those uh, hazardous materials out of our watersheds. Um, there are many questions that we couldn't get to tonight or we tried to get through through chat or, or other conversations. Um, if you contact either uh, Bruce, if he's your supervisor, or me, if I'm your supervisor, we'll do our best to get um, these questions answered. Also understanding that this is a process. We just got phase two uh, approved today. Uh, so we will have um, more information coming forth. Uh, and phase one just started last week. It's a long, unfortunately, a long uh, road, uh, but we're working ahead of schedule and uh, moving quickly. I appreciate that uh, Director Burris from the very beginning has put an emphasis on uh, moving quickly, but also accessing all the resources we can um, in order to address um, both the current disaster as well as build resiliency going forward. Um, so it's been a great partnership, but if you didn't get your questions answered tonight, please email your supervisor and we will farm them out and try to get, uh, get people uh, the answers they they need as quickly as possible. And um, thank you everybody for taking the time to join us tonight and uh, please stay safe and, um, and be, uh, and we'll hope for a speedy recovery. Thank yep. you. Be kind. Good evening. Thank <laughs> you.